But anyway, all right, Exodus chapter number eight, and we'll read this together, and then we'll teach a little bit here from this chapter. And the Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house and into thy bedchamber and upon thy bed and into the house of thy servants and upon thy people and into thine ovens and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee and upon thy people and upon all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people. And I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only? And he said, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy house, and from thy servants, and from the people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart, and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Exodus 8, verse 16, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth and it became lice in man and in beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there was lice upon man and upon beasts. Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else, if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants and upon thy people and into thy house. And the house of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground whereon they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end, thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people, tomorrow shall, shall this sign be. And the Lord did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servant's house and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. And Moses said, It is not meet so to do. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes? And will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. 
only you shall not go very far away, entreat for me. And Moses said, Behold, I go out from thee, and I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people tomorrow. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And he removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, and from his people. There remained not one. And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word tonight, dear Lord God, and for this, uh, Lord, great story from the word of God. And Lord, as we read it, Lord, we pause and think about the fact that this event, Lord, these, these moments of time actually took place, that Moses stood before Pharaoh, and that Pharaoh and Moses stood before God. And now, Lord, we stand here, Lord, and we think of this story, God, which you've given us in your word. And Lord, we pray that, God, you'd use it in our lives. Lord, help us to see the truth here tonight, Father, the truths, Lord, uh, that would help us to grow as Christians. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What, a, what an incredible story. I think the, the, uh, you can't read that chapter without the frog still on the show. I mean, who in, who in the world would imagine but God to say, you know what, I'm going to plague a nation. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to fill it full of frogs. Stinking, and, and you know, you can study that, and it's funny when you begin to study it and you look at it, and people are always trying to make the Bible say something it doesn't say. So you look into some of the commentaries and the commentators, you know, and I mean, they, they say, well, it shouldn't have been frogs. It was actually crocodiles. Now, can you imagine making your life and, and saying that you're a theologian and that you're a commentator, and you're going to actually write a book about the Bible, and you're going to come to this story here in Genesis, Exodus chapter number 8, when the Bible clearly says <coughs> frogs, and you're going to say crocodiles. There's a pretty big difference between a frog and a crocodile. Now, you say, well, they might have been mean frogs. And the meanest frog in the land is not going to be a crocodile. Amen. And look, and, and, if, and if it's true that they were dumb crocodiles, I mean, because, but a, a frog, these frogs just came in and, and they were frogs. You say, what kind of frogs? I don't know what kind of frogs they were, uh, but can, can you imagine being in your house and all of a sudden frogs just start coming through the windows? You're kneading troughs where you need your dough out and you're trying to get, can you imagine trying to pick the frogs out of your dough as you're trying to knead the dough and, and they're all over the place. You're in your tub soaking and all of a sudden it's full of frogs and there's frogs everywhere. And all of this because uh, Pharaoh has hardened his heart against God and he won't listen to God. He not gonna, he, he, he's hardened his heart against God and against Moses and he's, uh, he lies to Moses and he lies to God and said, I'll let your people go. And as soon as Moses pulls back the plague that God gave, he changes his mind and hardens his heart even more against the people. So he says to Moses, Moses says to him here, he, in verse number nine, Moses said to Pharaoh, glory over me. That, that means this. He said, you're in charge, Pharaoh. He said, I'm going to force you to pray. I'm going to force you to depend on God. Whether you like it or not, you're going to see, Pharaoh, you're going to see that not only, this, not only is God in charge, but God's providence rules in the land. God is precise. Look at the little statement that God said in verse number 22. He said, and I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, <clears throat> that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord, where? In the midst of of the earth. You see that? In the midst of the earth. He's saying, look, I want you to know, Pharaoh, that our God is not some God that's far off in some far away distant world. He's right here and uh, I'm his representative. And so Pharaoh, here's what we're going to do. You're going to glory over me. You're in charge. You're the boss. You tell me, I'm God's man here, but I'm your servant. You tell me when the frogs go and I'll let God know what you said. And your word will command me, and your word, even through me, is going to command God. <coughs> I don't know what's wrong with Pharaoh. 
like all the rest of these reprobates, he's mentally ill. He says, tell me when to get rid of the frogs. I don't understand this. Tomorrow. Now, what in the world is wrong with Pharaoh? What's in his mind? Why did he say now? Can you imagine? I mean, there's frogs everywhere, all over the place. Your wife is hollering, get the frogs. They're in my dough and your servants and your, I guess their wives didn't do much cooking then. I don't know. But whatever the case is, I mean, there's frogs everywhere. All you got to do is tell me when to get rid of them. And he says tomorrow. That doesn't even make sense. But man, it's a perfect picture of how many people there are that are lost. And, and Jesus went to the cross and he said, For whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Glory over me. All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is look into Jesus. Look and live. Be saved today. But how many people say tomorrow? Some other time. One, one more night in sin, one more night in, my, in, the, in, the, in the cesspool of my sin, one more night in sin. And so he said, all you got to do is ask. And so when, when, when he, the word came, Moses spoke the word to God and treated the Lord, and immediately the frogs died. But they didn't go away, the dead ones. Some of them went back to the river, but the land was full of frogs. And so they took them all up and they heaped them all up and the land stank. Can you imagine that? Now, if the Bible says something stank, rest assured, it stank. Amen. And can you imagine the land is full of dead, rotten frogs? What a perfect reminder of, of what sin and wickedness is. Amen. It stinks. The, then, then, though, it says here that uh, when they gather them together... And verse 16, the Lord said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Can you say, man, you're God and you can do anything you want to do, but it's almost like God is just saying, you know what? Here's the greatest Pharaoh, the greatest king, the greatest ruler on the face of the earth, the greatest empire. I could bring him down anyway. I could, I could send thunderbolts. I could do anything. But God said, you know what? I'd rather torment them with frogs. I'd rather send frogs. And when the frogs go away, you know what? I'm going to turn the sand. And there's a lot of sand in Egypt. I'm going to turn the sand into lice. Can you imagine that God said, I'm going to bring the nation down with lice. You know, people that want to go to hell and say, well, I'm going to go to hell and have a good time. They must be out of their mind. I, I was thinking about it this, this, this week a little bit, and we ought to think about hell. But yes, there's fire and torment and, and, and all those things. But can you imagine, you don't want to mess with God. Listen, you don't want to, you don't want to mess around with God. If you're lost and, and, you, and you know the truth and you know that Jesus went to the cross to die for your sin, you can be set free from sin. Don't harden your heart against God. You say, well, I'll show God. No, you won't show God. God will show you. And, and listen, and, and God sent the frogs. Then he sent lice. And the magicians up until that time had been able to emulate everything. And they said, well, we'll do that too. They come along and they try to make lice. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. If something's hurting you, why do you want to add to it? But that's the way sinners do. A man's under conviction. God's dealing with his heart. And, and listen, and he knows he's lost. And instead of getting saved, he'll go deeper and deeper in his sin. He'll go further and further from the truth. He called, why? Because that nature, that rebellious nature says, no, God's not going to tell me. And eventually, the sad thing is, eventually that man's heart becomes hardened. Now look what happened. This is an interesting thing. Verse 19, the magician said unto Pharaoh. Now, unless I'm wrong, these magicians, they hadn't gone fully reprobate yet. They hadn't gone because they recognized it was the finger of God. Now, not all of them, 
But there were some of those people in the land of Egypt that said, this is the finger of God. And, and, this, and the light bulb came on. They realized they, that God's doing something here. And if, if, the more you study the story, you'll see that more and more, Moses was becoming the leader in Egypt and the people were looking to him. Why? Because they were looking to his God. And there were people in Egypt from the children of Israel left Egypt. There was a mixed multitude that went with them. There were a lot of Egyptians that saw the truth of who the true and living God was and many of them began to fear God and wanted to worship him wanted to know him and they said to Pharaoh this is the finger of God but look what it says and Pharaoh's heart notice the wording and Pharaoh's heart was hardened meaning this that whenever his magicians whenever his own people said to him look look Pharaoh we see something here there's something going on here they saw it. But at that point, Pharaoh's heart was already so hardened that he couldn't see it. That's what really, that's what a reprobate is. It's whenever you are past the point where no matter what God does, you don't see it. People argue the point of a reprobate and they'll want to say, well, anybody can be saved anytime, anywhere. But the problem is once you're a reprobate, you don't want to be saved. You don't hear God's voice. You don't see God's word. You, 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 you're, you're oblivious to it. God ceased to deal with you. You're done. You're finished. You say, well, I'll just put God off and put God off, and you'll become reprobate sometime, and you'll be a dead man living. And that's where Pharaoh was at this point. He had his opportunity. His magicians saw that God was working. But by this point, he was already hardened. You know, it's sad sometimes that Christians don't even see God working. That worries me. That concerns me. I mean, we don't see the hand of God in things. And we ought, to, we ought to be mindful of the fact that, listen, how God works in our life. And that's why we sing that song, Count Your Many Blessings, Name Them One by One. You know, we go, we go sometimes in Romans chapter 1, before they, their heart was hardened, before they became reprobate, what's the first thing it says? They were unthankful. They don't acknowledge God. They refuse to retain God in their knowledge. And you know, as Christians, and people ought to get weary of it with us, but they ought to get, and they ought to get tired of it because we ought to be always pointing out the fact, boy, look what God did here, and boy, God's done this, and look how God's provided. And we ought to always be rejoicing and praising God. You know, in chapter 8, verse number 1, it said, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Isn't that an interesting thing? You know what it means to serve the Lord? It, to fulfill their purpose. What is our purpose? Psalm 150, verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Well, let's see how that relates to this story. Look at Hebrews chapter 13 just for a minute. <coughs> Look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, chapter 10. Where we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Now verse 12. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Verse 13 says, let us go therefore, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. What's this chapter we're reading about, about the people of Israel going outside, out into the wilderness, outside the camp, where? To, to do what? To offer sacrifice unto God. Look what the Bible says. Let us go, for, verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Verse 14, for we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Verse 15, by him, therefore, let us offer what? The sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. 
the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. You know, that's not that difficult. If you and I as Christians would just not be encumbered by all the things and, 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 and dwell on all the negatives and just begin to say, you know what? God's done this and, and, and God's provided this. And we ought to count those blessings, talk about them to our children and discuss them as husband and wife. And, and when we meet people, we ought to talk about the praises of God. Man, I wish we'd do it in church, you know. We have testimony time. Somebody just come to church and listen. Well, I want to praise God for this and how God's done this and, and God's provided here. We ought to always be about the, the business of serving God with our praises, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. It's like, and, and, this, and this verse is talking about here in a minute about the, uh, being a, a, a weird or an anomaly. People getting aggravated by that. I remember the story, whether it's true or not, but uh, a fellow had come to church and he's always praising God and thanking God for everything and just talking about how good God was. And one time this little city had been in a, in a terrible uh, drenching rain, just went on for weeks and everything was mud and it was just a mess. And this fellow walked to church and there's another man there and he was tired of the rain. Everybody was tired of the rain. And he went into the service thinking, and the thought hit him. He said, that rascal, he said, if he's in church today, he said, and he stands up and starts praising God, he said, I'll know he's a hypocrite. He said, I'll know he's a liar. He said, because ain't nobody can be praising God after all this rain we've had. He said, we've, I mean, things are flooded. Everything's ruined. I mean, uh, it's just a mess. That fellow came to church that morning, sat through the service, looked quiet. The fellow, other fellow was happy. He said, well, he's going to stay quiet. He ain't going to do it this morning. Before the service started, before the preacher started, that fellow jumped up. And he said, I just got to stand up and say something with my heart. He said, I just want to praise God. And that fellow said, here he goes, big liar. He said, I just want to praise God. He said, you know, I've been thinking about all this rain. He said, boy, we sure have had a lot of rain, don't we? He said, I just want to praise God. It don't rain like this all the time. He said, we wouldn't make it. He said, I know God will take care of us. That fellow just shook his head. You know, you got to praise God about everything. You ought to be something to praise the Lord. I had a, a back in Bible college there, and when I was in Indiana, I had a teacher that I love, thought the world of it, man. He praised God all the time. One time I was up in the mezzanine area, sitting, hiding, you know, and I'm sitting up there, and I looked over at him, and uh, his wife, man, is giving him the devil. I mean, she is chewing him out about something, and I mean, she's just going on, and all the time she's doing it, he just started praising God. I mean, he just started saying, praise the Lord, amen, you know, and going. he totally ignored her. I thought it was awesome. But uh, I, I'm just saying, praise the Lord about stuff. Praise God for what he does for you. And so that's what it means to serve the Lord. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. And so the, in verse 19, the magician said, this is the finger of God. They said, Pharaoh, something's going on here. We don't understand it, but this is real. But Pharaoh's heart was already hardened. And it says this, he hearkened not unto them. He wouldn't listen. You know, a reprobate gets to the place where they just won't hear you. They're not interested. They won't listen. They're done for. You say, I'll never get that way. Listen, if God's dealing with you and talking to you and someone's praying for you and every time they try to talk to you, you blow them off, you, you shut them down, someday you'll cross that line and become a reprobate and you'll be damned to hell forever. People all around you will be saying, look, God's on this and God's on that. But in your heart, you'll say, there is no God. God's not doing anything. That's just fate. That's just coincidence. Look at verse number 20. The Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. While he cometh forth to the water and saying to him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Else if thou let not my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground wherein they are. Can you imagine that? Swarm. You know, how many flies does it take to be in a, too many flies? One fly. One fly. I can still, my grandpa died when I was 15 years old. I can still recall his hatred of flies. 
My dad was the same way. Dad wouldn't abide in a house with, until all the flies were dead. I mean, he couldn't stand flies. And uh, can you imagine a swarm of flies? Swarms on the ground, everywhere you walk, stomping flies. I heard that they grounded the president's uh, plane because of a swarm of cicadas. Did y'all see that? Got in the little turbine. I thought that was a... I say, he got a picture, video of a cicada landing on his neck, and he swatted it off, you know. And uh, <laughs> uh, you got to love God. he got a sense of humor. He's a wonderful God. Yeah, <laughs> I just, just wish the timing would have been a little bit better. But uh, it, so he said here, though, look at this in verse 22. I want you to see this. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen. What's the big deal about the land of Goshen? That's where God's people were. God said, I'm going to send flies. Have, have, have you ever told a fly what to do? Anybody think you could train a fly? How about a swarm of flies? Well, God can. God said, I'm going to say to all these flies, they're going to attack all you people. I'm going to cut them loose on you, but I'm going to draw a line around Goshen because my people are there. I'm going to show you, Pharaoh, I'm going to show all your people that there's a God in heaven and that those are his people and I'm going to watch over them and I'm going to fill your land full of filthy flies, maggot infested laying flies. But there won't be a one in Goshen. Now, isn't that something? Well, God did that. Look what it said. He said, I will sever. That means cut off. Can I tell you something? Here's where we're going. We're a severed people as Christians. We're cut off from this world. You see, we're God's people. That's what it means to be saved. That's what the word church means. I don't understand why this is a big deal. And I don't, you, you all know I don't use a bunch of Greek and Hebrew stuff like that. But that word church means to be, it's a called out, cut off assembly. We're not part of the world. We're separated. We're the bride of Christ. We're cut off from the world. He said, come out from among them and be a separate unto me, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, whether we come out or not. To be saved means we're, to cut, be, we're cut out from the world. We're separated. That's what he's showing here. He said, I will put a division. He said in verse 22, I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Verse 23, and I will put a division. Who, who will? Everything you find about God in the Bible, from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through the Bible, in, Genesis, in Revelation, whenever he calls his people out, and we go to heaven to be with him forever, and the lost <clears throat> are cast into hell forever. Everything you see about God, you'll see that there's a division. God divided the light from the darkness. And God want, demands, not once, demands His people be divided from the world. Amen. Separate from the world. You say, preacher, do you teach separation? If I don't, then I deny the Bible. So I don't like to teach that. I believe that we ought to assimilate. Now, I'm not against a person trying to be salt and light. But if that means assimilate with the world, I'm against it. Now, I think sometimes people use that slogan to mean that, and that's, that's not what it means. We're to be separate from the world. You say, well, what does it mean to be separate from the world? It means that they know that we serve and we trust the true and living God. And, and, and I'm gonna, there are multiple ways that they identify that, but they know we're different. Now look what it says. I'll put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And now notice what happens. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron 
and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God, where? In the land. That means stay close by, in the land, here in Egypt. In the land. Don't separate, don't leave. So now look what he says. Moses said, It is not meat so to do. That word meat means it won't work. He said, our duty to God, our sacrifices to God, our service to God is not compatible with the land of Egypt. He said, we can't do it here. We can't stay here and do what God wants us to do. Look what he said. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God. Now, what in the world does that mean? He explains it in the next part. Lo, shall we sacrifice the abominations of the Egyptians before their eyes? What's he talking about? It, to the Egyptians, it was an abomination, basically to kill uh, certain, there were certain cows that you couldn't kill, but especially the lambs. It was an abomination in, the, in Egypt to kill a lamb. It's forbidden. Isn't that something? How the devil trains his people to reject that thing which God symbolizes as himself. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. You know, when you start talking about somebody about being saved, and, and they'll say, well, I'll be good. I, I'm going to be good in my religion. No, you know, your religion won't save you. You know, to the, to the uh, both to the, uh, whether you speak to, the, to a man that worships the God of Judaism or to a man that worships the God of Mohammedism, and you say to them that Jesus died for their sins, you know, when you say that, if they do what they want to do and they're steeped in their religion, they'll spit on the ground. They'll reject that because that's a mockery to them. And in so many different points, I don't even have time to get into all of it. But for one, the idea that you say that God had a son. The idea that you say that, that a man, that's what they call Jesus. They deny him any deity. That a man could take your sin. You know, Catholicism, whenever you go and stand before the priest and you go in there to the confessional, the priest absolves you of your sins, supposedly. Why? Because there couldn't have been a lamb. They reject the lamb. They reject the lamb. The Ju Judaism rejects the lamb. Mohammedism rejects the lamb. Mormonism rejects the lamb. John said, behold, the lamb of God was taken away the sin of the world. Every religion on the face of the earth mocks the lamb, rejects the lamb. And you say to someone to be saved, all you got to do is accept Jesus Christ, the lamb of God. Well, I'll make him my Lord. Hmm. You know, it doesn't say the Lord. Making him your Lord saves you. Amen. He has to be your lamb. Yep. Even amongst Christians, there's a circle of people that said, that teach this thing called lordship salvation. And they'll say, well, he's got to be your Lord. You got to make him your Lord. You don't make him your Lord to be saved. He's your lamb. You got to have a lamb. Amen. The world says, no, there's got to be something more than that. And literally, they'll scoff at the idea that you say, you know what? I'm saved because of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. That taketh away the sins of the world. That Lamb represented uh, spotless. That Lamb represented innocence. He was led as a, as a sheep before the shears is dumb. Sheep hardly even have a mind. They don't, they don't think very much. They don't have their own mind and so, but this idea uh, of, of the Jews, they were going to offer a sacrifice. And Moses said to them, if we do what God wants us to do the way God wants us to do it, it's going to be an abomination to you. He said, if we do what we're supposed to do, and if we worship God the way we're supposed to worship God, it's going to be so offensive to you. Look what he said. He said, if we do it the way we are supposed to do it, before the Egyptians, before their eyes, will they not stone us? Isn't it funny? That's what they did to Stephen whenever he preached to them, to the Jews, and told them about Jesus, the Lamb of God, what they do. 
They gnash their teeth. <coughs> they gnashed their teeth. Then they picked up stones and stoned him. Why? Because he preached Christ crucified. You say, man, everybody ought to be glad for the gospel. No, lost people hate the gospel. A reprobate, unsaved, wicked person like that will hate the gospel. And even a lost man... Many times, the first time he hears the gospel, based on what he's heard before, he'll hear it and say, it can't be that easy. Nope. What that's saying is, that belittles it. Brother Chuck, you know this, and I said at your dad's funeral, I sat on the couch at, Matt, at the house, your dad said to me, it just seems to me like Christianity is a simple man's religion. At that time, he thought he was too smart for it. And we talked, and I, I talked to him many, many times, and that was probably fit 12 years before he passed away. But God continued to work in his heart. Amen. And he got saved. His whole disposition was different about it. He never said those things. Not even the same, really. And I'm not saying this as a, to scare anybody, but, you know, when you're that hard like that and God saves you man it's it's like daylight to dark and Chuck could tell you things and Connie could tell you things about John and hey, people anybody that knew him know it was daylight to dark just his attitude and his disposition why because light entered in Christ came in but all of his family had been saved and trusted the Lord but still in his mind it was an abomination, almost. What in the world are you talking about? Thankfully, he hadn't crossed that line yet. But many, many a person treads that line. They tread that line. And you don't know. God's a merciful God. But man, I wouldn't want to be skirting that line tonight. I wouldn't, I'm glad I'm saved, aren't you? Amen. Aren't you glad you're on your way to heaven? Man, if you don't have any other reason to rejoice, rejoice in the fact that you've been severed from the world and you're part of the family of God and you trusted the, you trusted the Lamb. Now, notice what he said. He said, we're going to go and we're going to do what God... He said, we will go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as he shall command us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only you shall not go very far away. And then he said this, entreat for me. Yeah, I don't know what he's saying, but it sounds to me like he's saying, pray for me. But there's no hope. He knows there's no hope. He's saying, when you go away to pray, say a prayer for me. Because I believe that Pharaoh knew in his heart that he was gone. I believe he knew and he realized that he had rejected the truth and that his heart was hardened and there was no hope for him. He knew it. You know, a person like that, they'll know it. They'll know it. I wish I could get them to preach and teach about being reprobate because they will tell you what it's like to be past that point. I've heard the testimonies before. But I want you to see something real quick here just now if you would. Look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 27. I want to teach one thing and I'm done tonight. Proverbs 29, 27. Look at this verse, if you would. An unjust man is an abomination to the just. An unjust man, an unjustified man. I believe you could use that word just, talking about justification. An unjust man is an abomination to the just. Now look at the rest of the verse. And he that is upright in the way is what? Abomination to the wicked. Isn't that something that God uses that? Complete opposite. He says, an unjust man is an abomination to the just. But you know what we are to them? We're an abomination to them also. You say, well, I don't think it has to be that way. I think we can cohabitate. And you're right, we can a little bit. But when it gets real, when it gets serious, when it gets down to you and I <clears throat> getting along with God and, and, and serving the Lord... 
and things get serious and it's time to separate from the world, it's impossible for us to cohabitate in this world. Come out from among them. And then when we do that, the world begins to say, well, who do you think you are? What do you think? You're better than we are? Who, what, what do you think? You think uh, that you, you're just uh, holier than thou? You go to church all the time? You carry your Bible around? Like the fellow said one time, you, you, carry, you saw reading the Bible, he said, you carry the Bible, keep your, carry your religion on your sleeve, you know? Who do you think you are carrying your Bible around? What are you, a Bible thumper? Oh, you one of them hellfire and damnation people? All holy, you know, you won't drink and you won't do, do dope and you, and you want to go to church all the time and you don't have any fun and, and listen, what's wrong with you, they'll say. You're an abomination to them. When you live right, or you can say, well, I don't want to be that way. I don't want the world to think bad of me. So you skirt the line. You don't go very far away. You say, I'm saved, but I, wanna, I don't want to leave the land of Egypt. I don't want to be weird. I don't want to be an oddity, so I'm going to try to worship the Lord and fit in. we got churches like that all over the place. You can say what you want to say, but in many a church, the worship service, they call it, is worldly. And they'll tell you that the purpose of that worldly worship service is to make the lost people that come to the service feel entertained or feel comfortable. Or the carnal Christians, we don't want to offend them. We don't want to have people come to church and have to sit through a song service and sing songs on the piano and, and or like uh, just stand up and sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, that's boring. We gotta have an entertainment show. We gotta we gotta appeal to the flesh nature. People don't want to come and hear that. And that's what they'll teach. You know, our worship, our service to God ought to be light and darkness from the world. It's what God said. Light representing truth and, and darkness representing the world. And you know, a man never walked around the light and said, well, I think it's dark. He never walked in the dark and said, I think it's light. You know the difference between daylight and dark. And our walk with God, our worship before God, when we, discern, when we determine to separate, come out from among them, it ought to be so definitive and so plain and so clear that we're an abomination to the world. Amen. Yeah, look at you Christians, look at how you raise your kids. Brainwashing them. Right. Teaching them the Bible. Discipline them according to the Bible. What's wrong with you? Don't you know, it, don't you know what uh, uh, doc, Dr. Uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah. No, yeah, no, no, older than him. Oh, Dr. F yeah, Dr. Spock. Yeah, don't, yeah, Dr. Spock, Dr. Phil too. He's, he's a good, another one. What old Dr. Spock teaches about, Ray, you know, uh, you, uh, uh, you, you spank those children, you're going to wound their conscience. No, you'll, you'll save the Bible's contrast to that. Amen. You know, the, the Bible teaches discipline your children, and you do that, and the world says you're, kill, that says you're beating them, kids, you're hurting them. But that's why our country's in the shape that it's in. It's because we have a bunch of undisciplined, unloved children that are grown up in homes where they're not trained biblically. Amen. The world will look at your standards and they'll look at your dress and they'll say, man, you don't act like us. and You don't do what we do. What's wrong with you? And even some Christians will say, you know what? You're not going to win anybody that way. You're going to have to assimilate a little bit. You're going to have to, you, you have too high standards. Your convictions are offensive. You, you teach your own children? What's wrong? Do you think you're better than everybody else? They'll use all those things. You know what? That's exactly what's going on here. Moses said, look, Pharaoh, if we worship God the way God expects us to worship him and we're here and your people, you heathens are watching us, it'll be so foreign and so crazy to you that you'll kill us. It just won't work. You know, like it or not, that's one of the reasons why we come to church. 
You say, well, I just think church is anywhere. Okay, then let's go down here on Patrick Street and let's go down there and let's just all start singing uh, Amazing Grace and I'll preach and then let's have a prayer meeting. You know what? Some people would like that. And there'd be some people yelling, screaming, cussing at us. Get off of here. Get out of here. You're in the way. You have to put up with that. But you know, we, we, come, to the, we come to the church house I don't know if people discredit the church house, but we come in here and we sing songs that glorify the Lord and praise the Lord. This is our turf. A Christian ought to have his own turf, amen? amen. And if people come in here and they're wicked and vile and filthy and they, don't, they reject that book right there, we might say, look, you're here, you want to listen, you listen. If you don't like it, get out. If they don't want to live right and behave right, then go. The Bible teaches that. Amen? Amen? That's what church discipline is all about. If you don't want to do right, then you're not welcome here. You say, well, I thought we welcomed everybody. Well, what's the point of having a church? Right. If you're not going to have any kind of discipline or try to take care of things. You say, well, there was a mixed multitude went out with them, right? And they all got circumcised. Yeah. That, you know what that word circumcision means? It means severed. It means cut off. Now we call it the circumcision of the heart, which is greater than circumcision of the flesh. But they were circumcised. And once they were circumcised, cut off from the world, then they were allowed to fully integrate in the Passover feast and worship with God's people. Amen? Amen? You'll never know God until you separate from the world. Amen. And God was saying, he said, my people are already separate from the world. The flies never touched Goshen. But then God said to his people, now it's time for you to live like you're separate from the world. It's time to get out of Egypt. Pharaoh, okay, you can go, but just don't go very far. Don't go very far. Now, I don't know if three days journey was far enough, but I guess Moses said three days journey but I'll say this, the further we get from the world, the better. <clears throat> because the truth is you can never go too far. You say, well, what if, you're a, what if you become radical? Praise the Lord. You say, well, they'll, people will start accusing you of being a Mennonite or something. That's all right. You know what? It wouldn't be a bad thing. I'm going to give you a testimony. I've never told anybody this. I was in Exxon and Nitro about a month ago. I'd been working. I, you know, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't drinking booze or nothing, but I didn't, I didn't look like, I probably looked kind of rough, you know. And outside there, there was some, I pulled up right beside of the fellows, and I was hoping to try to talk to them. I'm pretty sure they're Mennonite. They had their beards and their hats on and identified. And so I went in and paid for my gas, and the two fellows was in there talking. And he said, man, what are them people? He said, some kind of Christians. I can't tell what they are. He said, we get all kinds of Christians stop in here. And they're just talking. And I, I didn't say anything. I just wanted to hear what they had to say. I just kept my mouth shut, you know, and just listened to them. But what they were doing is, here's these two guys. And I talked to them. I stopped in there quite a bit. But, but they, identif they were identifying those people as separate. Is that bad? Is it, is it so bad if... Where we go, people look and say, what's, you people are different. Would it, would it be terrible if they saw our kids and said, y'all are different? Amen. And even though some of them will scoff and some of them will mock, and some of them might even pick up stones, there's going to be some that say, you know what, I want to be different too. I, I want to know your God. Look, we're all up here swatting flies, and y'all's down there sipping lemonade. How's that happen? That ain't fair. Well, wait a minute. Hey, the same God that kept the flies off us, he'll watch over you too. You just separate. Now again, that mark of circumcision, that didn't carry over in the New Testament. That's not what saved people. The circumcision of the heart enter into Christ. Once we're in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're one in Christ. We're separate. We're God's people. Amen? And when we... We can get along with the world to a degree. 
And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about in a, just a normal way. I mean, you know, we live in this world. I mean, we can go to the grocery store. We, can do, we don't have to go in the grocery store every time we go in there. We don't have to preach a sermon to everybody and get kicked out. I mean, to a degree. But there's going to be times when God says, look, I want, you to, I want you to stick out like a sore thumb. I want you to open your mouth. And boy, we better be willing to do it. And not be afraid of what the world thinks of us. Now, Moses wasn't afraid, but he was a realist. He said, I know what you're going to think of us. He said, you're going to, he said, when you see what we do and how we worship our God, he said, y'all are going to lose your minds and you're going to try to kill us because you won't understand. So we're going to go out and have church in the wilderness. And that's what God called it. Amen. Church in the wilderness. You say, well, it didn't mean church. I know, I know. I've heard all that nonsense before. But listen, that's what God wants us to do. It's sever, severed people, separate from the world. Amen? And uh, when we're not like them and they wonder what's wrong with us, then we just need to let them know that our faith is in Christ and we've been separated from the world. Amen? You say, well, what does that mean to be separated from the world? One day, we're really going to be separated from the world. One day, he's going to say, come up hither. And then this world will be destroyed. And God pours out his wrath upon this world. But before he fully fulfills that and pours out his wrath, the believers are caught up to meet him in the air. We're separated. And then God destroys this thing. Amen. What a day that'll be when my Jesus I shall see. Amen. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. You think about that story, man, Pharaoh, what a complicated mess. You know, you just skip forward and go to the New Testament, and the same Jews that were in bondage to Pharaoh, Jesus said to them, you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they said, well, wait a minute, time out. We've never been in bondage to any man. How sad. They were in worse bondage in the New Testament when John the Baptist preached to them under the law and sin than they were in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. But yet when Jesus came to set them free, they rejected him. Isn't that sad? It's so easy to be saved. It's so hard to be lost. And then when we're saved, we ought to understand that God expects us to be separate from the world. Dear Heavenly 